So that means sugar is not going to be doing too well. In fact, when a rabbit, we've been, we've been shorting silver. Sugar. So this is something to kind of keep an eye on, too. This is an interna international market. If sugar keeps getting cheaper, what's going to happen to uh, the price of sugar? What's going to happen to the price of corn? Well, they have more competition, isn't there? So that's again driving the price of corn down. So you see how these markets kind of interact with each other? You do have to know what's going on around the world. Yeah, we used to use sugar for strictly to eat, but now it's an industrial compound. Okay, for all you livestock people, Look what's happened to the cattle market. Now well, fell apart there in January. Right here. <clears throat> and right here's the low. So you're probably not going to get much below a dollar thirty a pound. This is April futures. But do you see very much upside here? Well, if you do, it's going to be up to here. <coughs> So when should you sell cattle? Trick question. When should you sell cattle? When, you when they're ready. Yeah, there's their answer. Five dollars, <laughs> Yeah, you know, their cattle are ready. They keep gaining weight, but they get out of it and they don't have a prime. So therefore, when they're ready to go, you just about have to. So, is there anybody in here who raised cattle on contract? Anybody who raised hogs on contract? Oh, you're all on your own. Okay. But the livestock industry is looking kind of sad at the moment. That doesn't mean it's going to be sad forever. Because the big thing with cattle is there's not a whole lot of new cattle calves going on feed yet. And that isn't going to happen uh, for another month or two. Plus, the ones the ones are on feed, they're lower numbers than they were last year because of the drought, so they got entered into the feed bunks, feed lots and everything earlier. So they're coming to market around May. What about the, uh, the effects of the drought that we've had, like all last year, and then potentially for large parts of company or country for this year, uh, an effect on cattle? Wouldn't you think that you know, a lot of people that I've heard basically said they can't feed them. There's nothing to feed them, so they had to sell them. True. Now, they just, if you don't have anything to feed those critters, why like, you're going to have to walk them off to the you know, feed lot someplace else or just play them to the slaughterhouse. That's why the numbers are down a little bit. Now, is that going to uh, make prices go up for meat? Indirectly, it will. But if the economy is not doing too well, People are going to go, you know, if they're used to eating steak, they're going to probably downgrade to a hamburger. And if things really get bad, they're going to go to spaghetti and beans. In which case, you don't sell any hamburger at all. But this is something to watch. This is what the, everybody, the government's got this bright idea now of putting out what they call the chain to CPI. Chain means that uh, they've got it tied down. So if you can no longer uh, each state, they're going to substitute hamburger, which is a whole lot cheaper. That keeps the cost of living down. So if you're retired, are retired, or plan to be retired before too long, well, how about if we're just tired? If we're just tired? <laughs> Different category, you need Geritol. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but do you see a situation like that? You know, the, the government's trying to keep all this stuff down as low as they can. They don't want to have to pay out any more money than they absolutely have to. Because they want it for their own pet projects. They don't want to pay you or me, even though it's your money. So I better stop right there and want to get involved in this. Because uh, I have my own viewpoints and some of that, but that's another story. But cattle, uh, can, can meat prices go higher later? Yes, they can. Unfortunately, I think we're going to have to wait until probably May, June. 
if we don't have a stock market collapse in the meantime. The same is going to be true for hogs. Because what's going to happen here? What is the main comp com competitor of both cattle and hogs? Chickens, yeah. Those uh, two-legged uh, winged cow friends. And some of it, uh, you know, you've probably had some chicken maybe at the supermarket. You know something was done to it. Doesn't taste quite right. But that's, you know, the way it goes. But it's the same. It's competing against hogs and chicken and uh, the meat of uh, cattle. This is just the way the marketplace works. So that means that when you see this, notice we hear there's a plateau right here, kind of get temporarily affected here at 88, uh, excuse me, 87.50. But the, here's the low right here, and that's around 84 for hogs. Can you raise hogs for 84 cents a pound? All you hog farmers out there. Can you do it? They do. Do you make much money doing it? No? You probably don't make a whole lot of money. I'll tell you where you need to make uh, you need hogs over $90. That's where you're going to make some money. You really will. But that's kind of the thing we're watching for hogs. Eyes? There's 92. So the meat industry looks kind of stable, sort of semi-stable for the moment. Okay, there's a few people who are gold bugs in here. And the, the thing about the gold market is kind of disappointing. You see this right here? It's in a slow downtrend. Now why is it in a downtrend? That's what you need to ask yourself. Because the high was $1,926 an ounce. That was back in 2011-2012. Well, now it's much less than that. <coughs> Here our high is about $1,800. This is on April futures. And people have more faith in the future. Excuse me. More faith in the future? What do you want to correlate that with? A little more acreage of the future, huh? All of it. Currency. But gold is the best choice among many bad currencies. Gold to the gold? Okay, you would just hit a point. Is gold now considered more of a less a currency? Gold right now is a little the dollars right now is a little safer than it's been. That's because other currencies are a little worse. Yeah, it's a dollars the best of the bad lots. Yeah, that's the bad. Okay, there's something else here that's happening. You know, two things. Number one, China is buying all the gold they can get. One gold to eat what? <laughs> no, they're just uh, they're through Hong Kong. They're buying. They also have what they call the Pan Asian Gold Exchange page. They're using that as a cover. And that's how they're buying a lot of this gold up. Plus, they're buying a lot of gold mines. In fact, I had one that they, they bought for me in the city. Uh, gold, and that was a Canadian company. One of the Western people from China went in and bought it up, lock, stock, and barrel. Made me cash, took my money, went elsewhere. I wasn't going to fight the Chinese. They got more money than the rest of the world put together, practically. But they're doing that. That's one of them. Number two, and probably more important for us, January 1st, the Federal Reserve deemed gold as a reserve currency for the banks. If you weren't really reading the Wall Street Journal, you didn't pick it up. This means that the banks can now hold up to, uh, as much gold as they want, and it's 100 percent value for the reserves. Before, the most they could hold was just about a little bit, and it was only 50%. In doing that, gold is now basically a reserve currency. Do you think those politicians in Washington will admit it? Absolutely not. 
gold is a barbaric metal. And when gold's involved, then they can't spend like they are doing right now. So I remember back in 1971, August 15th, exact date, uh, President Richard Nixon went on the air and said uh, he valued the gold value from $35 an ounce to $38 an ounce. He said this is one of the greatest decisions we've made in the history of the world. I thought at that time he was full of, you know what? You know what? He turns out to be right. Why? Because we no longer have a gold backing so they can print all they want. That is a big decision. So gold got freed from uh, all its chains, and it finally, by the January 20th of 1980, went up to $875 an ounce, or $850, I should say, and then came back down for 20 years. Now it's back up. It's been going up for 11 years in a row. So this means that the gold is now taking on some different characteristics. Now we won't know the whole ex uh, extent of this until a little later. But once everybody gets the wind that the uh, gold's now a U.S. reserve currency, they can hold it in lieu of other things like the euro or the Japanese yen or the Chinese remember. Uh, so, you know, this, this is a big thing. Keep an eye on that. So what does that mean for gold long term? Well, what's it mean for gold long term? Up. Up. Big time. Now, uh, if you look at the long-range chart of factor in inflation, you can see $3,500 an ounce for gold. How far out? Five years. That's 2017-2018. What's driving it down now in the short term? Though? What's driving it down? Uh, <coughs> they, some yeah, big speculators are selling. So there's a lot of sales going on by certain speculators. And there's a few co companies. The other thing that's driving it down is there's some, several big gold producers, Barrett included, that's PX on the exchange. They've got all kinds of gold that they've been mining. They dumped it. So, gold, so there's two of them. Gold, Vermont <coughs> mining, Barrett's, gold corp. Three of the biggest ones in the whole bit of business. They're all selling gold right now. Yeah. Why? They need the money. They gold got the gold. Pretty money, yeah. Long oh. Yeah, they're going to be good. Yeah, they will. Mm -hmm. uh, the one I like is Harmony, which I want. That's a South African and they also got a Philippine. They got the biggest gold reserves in the world. They have four and a half times more gold than four dollars. So that's the one to watch. Hey Larry, uh, I actually put and bought uh, more gold the last year than I did. It was very old. Germany has asked for their rule back out of our okay. reserves. Do we have it? Do we have it? Well, we say we do. I don't know if we really have it or not. It's supposed to be in the, not in the basement of the Federal, first of the Federal Reserve Bill the bank in New York. Uh, so is Germany going to get their money back? Yeah, I think they'll get some of it back. Why was it over here in the first place? You know why? Well, Cold War. That was, uh, they brought it over here in 1960 because they were afraid if Russia would get in there and start uh, through East Germany, invade the place, why then they wouldn't have any gold, so they brought it over here. Now they're shipping it back. Venezuela asked for all their gold back. So it's going to be real interesting to see how. So there's some exchanges going on. And that was also headquartered in the uh, Federal Reserve Bank in New York. And I don't, I don't want to get in front of you here because I, I think I know where you're going, but uh, at $3,500 ounce gold, and the gold now is back in the, you know, as a reserve currency, so all this money that we printed, does, does that, shall we say, get back to a, a, an equilibrium? Okay, why are you printing? Let me put it this way. Uh, I'm not sure where this all going to go because it's a political problem. So what the, the politicians deem, at least for now, that's probably the way they're going to go. They're trying to keep the price down. And you see in a minute, uh, they're doing a better job of silver because there's nowhere near as much silver as there is gold. There's 10 times as much gold above ground, in other words, mine, than there is silver. So at least that's according to the estimates. But as far as where gold goes in this thing, 
future is probably fairly bright. Now, there's one example, one exception. What happens if the Federal Reserve Board quits printing money? Yeah, besides the depression, interest rates will shoot up. The gold prices will go down. But so in other words, it's a, it's a tough, shall we call it a thermometer of how the uh, world views paper money? So, but, okay, you can't imagine what right before, and it was going to shoot up. What we do with all those trillions of debt that we have to pay interest on left? So don't you think that we have Only, to well, yeah, we pay interest now. Yeah, I know. But if interest rates shoot up, yeah, we have to pay a lot more interest. That's why we're trying to keep it down. You're going to see that when I take a look at the T-bond markets, how they're doing the failure. The, uh, if the interest rates shoot up, the portion of federal funding going to pay interest will be so large that they won't be able to do it. No. So that's, that's true. More, yeah. more, more, more money to keep interest rates down. They can't get off that very well. So the, the only way they're going to get off is they're going to have to defo uh, default. Well, yeah. Or have a wet inflation and so they can pay off with virtually worthless dollars. That sounds like the Weimar Republic back in 1923 in Germany. Let's move on to that one for a minute. Got a question here. Larry, what about platinum? You didn't mention anything because uh, I read some stuff about platinum has basically been lower than gold, but there's some movement showing that it's going to go. Let me go through silver, then I'll come back to yours. That, did you hold that? Yeah. Okay. Is there something else going on here in the silver market that's uh, kind of tied in with platinum? But the reason for that is, is because the government was talking about platinum uh, printing one huge coin of platinum for what they would call it a trillion dollars that take care of their deficit. Which is malarkey, but that's another story too. Silver is under a different situation. This market is controlled or manipulated is a better term for it, mainly by JP Morgan and Chase. They're the big bank. They've got around, they're short about 38,000 contracts. Well, that's, you know, that's about a third of um, an annual production of silver. When the market gets up here, they come in and buy all kinds of sell short. When the market gets here, they're doing the same thing. But if you notice too here, there's a, there's a gap right here. They finally filled it right here. But it doesn't seem to want to get much below $30 an ounce. That may well be in the new floor, even though it's down here earlier. So I suppose you could save $27 an ounce as the pilot furthest down it'll go. But here's the thing about silver. First of all, we use it uh, a lot for industrial as well as coinage. We don't use as much silver coinage, but some countries still do. But industrial, this building, you can't build it without silver. Uh, every contact, every electrical contact in here has a silver contact. If it doesn't, underwriter laboratories will not approve it. In that case, you can't get insurance. Because copper, is, which is another good one, uh, is proven to be not good enough and it tends to cause fires. The other two that are good or, is good or better than silver are gold and platinum. Now, who's going to use um, silver or gold and platinum when silver is only about $30 to $35 an ounce? Gold right now is around $1,600 and something, and platinum is over $1,700 an ounce. So that means silver is going to be used. Everybody's thought about, well, the photography business is they're no longer using film, so we don't need, need much silver. We're using more silver now than ever because all computers have silver. Your handheld, your iPhones, uh, iPod, all of them have silver contacts. There's a new chemical company. Um, material coming out called graphene, which is all carbon, and it's just as efficient or more efficient than silver. But the problem with that is it's also got a few dis disadvantages, which silver doesn't have. Specifically, it can short out pretty easy. So you gotta be careful. If you wanna fly a jet plane that has graphene contacts instead of silver, you go ahead, but I'm gonna have to make sure, if I have to go on that plane, I'm gonna make sure I got lots of life insurance. Well, if they dump that puppy, at least they'll keep the family going. <clears throat> so right now, they got some problems with that, but graphene is going to be the one to come up. It's a form of carbon. 
you can, they can actually mine. There's two mines, one in Canada and one in Madagascar. They both have a lot of graphene in them. But silver is, a, is the one that we're going to have to watch. There is more silver, uh, uh, probably Chase Manhattan's the biggest silver holder of all, along with the silver um, uh, sorry, E for that, E for electronic EFT, ETFs, electronic ten, uh, funds transfer, EFT. Uh, that's SLV, is that big silver contract there. They've got a lot of contract problems with uh, possible de delivery if things come, push comes to shove. Where's their time for silver? It's in, here, in London, I believe, so most of it is. But here's the thing, the other thing, geologically, most of the silver that is known, has been known, is already mined. The number one state for silver is Peru, closely followed by Mexico. The U.S. has some, Cordeline is the company, main company for that. And uh, then there's a couple other countries in the world that also have a fair amount of silver. Canada has some. So this means that uh, the U.S. Geological Survey even admits that uh, we got a lot more gold in the ground than we have silver. So what happens when we run out? We're going to have to figure out something. So eventually, silver is going to make a big move. And when they blow that, those hedges off, look out. $100 an ounce silver would be probably pretty easy to make because there'll be a shortage. And there's a shortage already built. Let's move on to a couple of them. If you want to talk more about that, we can do that when we come back. What time frame are you looking at silver? Time frame, that's a good question. Uh, for silver, the big thing with silver is how long are these uh, short sellers from like J.P. Morgan Chase going to be able to keep doing it? At least if they have a lot of funds, they use the U.S. Treasury for their funds. And it's to the U.S. government's advantage to keep the price down. Because they blow that out, it's going to shut down all kinds of industries. Anybody use this stuff? This black glue called crude oil? Does anybody also know how much does it cost to produce a barrel of crude oil in U.S. dollars? Eighty bucks. Eighty? Fifty dollars. In the U.S., it costs a little more than that. About seventy-five. Why are we still producing it? Well, because some of it's a side effect of gas. It's fracking. Anybody here from Western North Dakota? The Williston area. The Bakken Shale, the Eagle Point Shale. Um, <coughs> Three River Shale, that's also underneath Bakken in North Dakota. That's rich in oil and Bakken is. Here's the big thing here. It's right around between 85 and 88 dollars an ounce for a barrel. That seems to be a buy. The cycles of oil show a major rally coming up, and it's going to be before long. If, when I say before long, probably by the end of March. How many of you got all their oil supplies, gas, diesel, and diesel supplies for the year? You got a couple. If you got it in here, let's just ride in uh, November, December, then you got about as cheap as you're probably going to get. Be sure you have some stabilizer in it so it doesn't lose its effectiveness. So, this is something that uh, we're going to be watching. And there's a couple of big question marks here. What's going to happen to Syria? I think the shot is probably out. But uh, he's he going out with um, another walk out of fight. What happens about Iran over there on the Straits of Hormuz? Uh, there's another situation. What about those, um, excuse me, uh, Venezuela? You got an alien chief that's uh, got cancer. He's slowly dying in Cuba. Whether he ever gets back home again, that's another story. He can be at the fourth largest uh, deposit of oil, heavy oil, in the world. 
So Canada's got second largest, half a bunch of guitar sounds. No, Larry, I just talked to a um, guy that runs a tow truck operation out of that Dickinson area, and he was out snowmobiling in Cook City. He said there's enough oil up in that North Dakota, South Dakota area that'll make the Middle East look small. And he said they've got wells up there right now that are producing as high as 5,000 barrels a day out of a single well. Is that, is that so? No, but I'll tell you what, the one thing that nobody's telling you about is something about shale. It tends to have a fairly short half-life, and they got to go in and redo it again. So you have good production for a little bit, then it tails off rather quickly. There's the oil wells over in Saudi Arabia. They can produce the uh, same basic rate for years. Won't happen in the shale. They have to redo the, some of those wells. So they're going to be drilling all the time. But yes, there, there's a lot of oil up there. Eagle Shale down in Texas has as much or more. Ohio has a big shale problem too. Ohio's got eastern half of Ohio, Marcellus Shale. Yes. That's what they want. That's more in the gas, though. But uh, they've, got, they've got a lot of stuff, too. Well, they're getting better at that fracking. My brother works out there. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. They're, they're, they're fine tuning the sand and stuff they're putting in, so they're keeping them open. The pressures are open, and they're still you know, out of rocket and everything else to keep things open so it doesn't tail off quite as quick. So why, why hasn't that driven our oil price down here in the U.S.? Why hasn't it driven down the oil price here? Because we're not importing as much now as we were. So that means that we're substituting that bad oil and gas for what we were importing. They're also trying to get it on our floor. I mean, there's so far we're not building the infrastructure to ship it out. All the wells out there are only producing 10 or 20 percent. There's absolutely no place. They don't have a pipeline up there to take it out. Mm -hmm. So that's why they want to bring in this Keystone XL. Okay, did you want to say what there was? He told me they were averaging about five completed wells a week, start to finish. Is that what your brother's going to say? Right, depends on how many rigs up there going and they can each pump a hole about every 30 days if everything goes right. And it takes 7 million gallons of water that they got to pump down to frack them on the average. And then yeah. they got to dispose of the 7 million gallons of water after they get done fracking them. And then they pump them to be held for 60 days, because for 60 days they can burn the natural gas off without saving yeah, There's some regulations on that. Yeah, for, what they, they got flaring is they can burn it off without saving it. Yeah, so they flaring. can pump the shit out of them. So they don't have to burn the gas because they can't do it anymore. There's regulations on that. But everything, the infrastructure for most of the wells are year before. What they what they drilled last year, they might get the infrastructure in this year. Well, there's two pipeline companies working on building a pipeline. Excuse me. One of them is a Pembina pipeline. They're out of Canada, so they're taking care of the Saskatchewan and the extreme north of North Dakota. They're handling that. And the other one is ETP, uh, Energy Transfer Partners. They're also building some in there. And there's a couple other small ones that are also working in that. You can have them right now, they're probably shipping more oil off of the railroad. Railroad, yeah. Because who ships? Who owns the railroad? Uh -huh. Warmbuck. Yep. And the railroad right now are getting tough to get rail you. Well, it's, it's interesting how they go. Well, let's get back to this right here. Yeah, there's some interesting stories going on in that. I've known that oil has been out there since I was out there doing work for Mobile Oil Corporation in 1963. I was in Wyoming, so I was in the Powell River Basin and up in that area. So clear northeastern Canada, um, Wyoming, and then to uh, western North South Dakota and northern uh, and central Montana. So I knew the stuff was out there. We all saw it because uh, oil shales, one of those got a very interesting characteristic to them. Number one, you can put a match on a good piece of oil shale and it'll burn. That rock will burn, burn, burn. When it burns, it expands in volume. It doubles the volume after it's all burned out. It's a shale. And that shale turns kind of a reddish color. So that's part of that shale. So that's some of the interesting characteristics of that oil shale. I've been down in Texas, 
down south of Amarillo. Actually, down south of Lubbock and uh, uh, yeah, Midland area. And there's a lot of oil down there, especially you go south of there into the Eagle Plain Shale, which is fairly deep, and uh, it's a different type of oil shale. But it still does the same basic thing. This is why if you try to process oil shale, it expands. What are you going to do with all the waste? You can have a, a expand about the same amount as this room, and the waste is going to fill up with this whole building. Well, that becomes a problem. The stuff expands when you burn it. Therefore, when you frack it, then it's not going to expand nearly as much. But they have to expand it enough so they can break up the <coughs> shell pieces so you can get the gas and all that out. Don't be surprised you see oil up to over $100 a barrel before the end of March. So if you got your oil, if you don't have your oil, you need to get some, consider getting some of that bought up before you head to the field. Don't worry about what President Obama says about uh, clean energy. We gotta, we gotta have oil, folks, because otherwise we can't run. Peabot, here's one you watch out for. This could be a dynamite. The value of a Peabot right now is around 143 to 144 on the chart. Uh, since this is in a thousand, that means uh, each bond is worth about $1,440 a bond. What's its face value? 1,000. Your interest rates are figured on 6% at a 1,000 rate bond. What are they going to pay you when it comes mature? 1,000. Do you see the problems developing here? You're getting, you buy a bond right now, and you're guaranteed to lose eventually $440 a bond. Yes, you're going to get some interest rates, but interest is cheap. This time, this 30 year bond came around 2.5 to 3%. Now, where's the problem? Besides that, that's small potatoes compared to this. Who owns these bonds? The Federal Reserve owns a pile, don't they? Federal Reserve owns a pile, that's true. China. China. That's the answer we're looking for. What happens if they get nervous about these bonds? They can flood the market. They can flood the market. I don't know if they will themselves, but they're going to have some willing accomplices. Because uh, have you ever, anybody ever heard the term vigilante bond people? What's a vigilante? Somebody doesn't believe in following the code of order. I think it's a code of order. In other words, they're going to sell stuff if they have to. Okay, who besides China owns all these bonds? Japan is another one. Okay, let's put the governments together. They're big holders, right? You got uh, China, Japan. You also have somebody like, uh, uh, how about Germany? We've got some. Every, almost every country in the world has got some key bonds. If one or two of them starts getting nervous, if they're small potatoes, they're not going to worry too much about them. If they're big potatoes, that means the order is a different color. But who in this country owns a lot of these bonds? They're a potential vigilantes. Let's start with one of them. Pension funds. What happens if they start getting scared or they have to revalue? And there's going to be a crisis on their hands. Which means they may have to sell bonds in order to get money. When is that going to happen? Depends on the fund. If you're down here in Illinois, I don't know if you've got any funds left. We're probably about the most corrupt state in the union, with the possible exception of the other one, number one, California. I mean, there's two last cases like uh, you aren't going to believe. I'm wondering if my, even if my pension's going to be any good. 
since most of my comes from out at Springfield. But if they get nervous, who is to say they can't uh, start dumping bonds? So what's going to happen here? We'll start going down. Who's another one that really is a big one too? That uh, has bonds, lots of them. How about insurance? They use that uh, as their underwriting uh, reserves. T bonds. They were paying that interest. A lot of things start to get nervous. Who's to say it might be uh, somebody like Travelers or John Hancock when they start writing you up? Now, can the Treasury try to fight this? Yeah, they buy, they buy more. They buy, well, they buy something, but the, the rules are they can only buy new bonds. They can buy 85 billion a month. That's all new bonds. Yep. Uh, but what about these old bonds? That's the point. If the old bonds come in here, Treasury can't do anything about it. Of course, I realize that the Obama administration is kind of not following a lot of the rules. And I won't go any further than that. But so you can know what I do? Yeah. Oh. You watch in Illinois. The, the governor now is going to end up in jail. Third one? Third one? Oh, shoot. Since 1950, we've had, what, about six? <laughs> Otto Turner was one. He was a judge who got thrown in jail. And think that would be bad to do that. Jim Thompson probably should be in jail. But that's another story. I know I've had to deal with uh, you know, Pat Quinn, the governor, since I was on the board for uh, the state retirement to, all the state retirement people for Northwestern Illinois. Just got off of that December 1st, and I'm glad to get out. Glad dealing with him is, man, it's like talking to a brick wall. Uh, what's her problem? They're co-mingling funds. That's a federal offense. They were taking funds from the Long to the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, and they were using it to pay us, uh, two of them. One of them were paying for a, a hospital group, which is not a mutual um, a museum, and then another one they were paying for a road project because it was short of funds. Now I know that's a pretty strong statement, but I know that from personal experience. So don't be surprised if uh, two or three years from now you'll see Pacman sitting in a you know a striped suit on. So I guess the point is, if you want to, um, you know, run for politics, go ahead, but you'll probably get a jail term with it. And I'm not so sure about California either. That's another story too. But here's the problem. Notice the T-bonds are heading south. That means interest rates are going higher. Sounds depressing, doesn't it? At what point will interest rates get up to the point where it's going to start causing problems for people? I've got two farmers to buy in uh, my area. They have borrowed ooze, you know, of money to buy up land around them. If interest rates go up, I know they're dead. They're dead ducks. Because there's no way they can finance everything with interest rates going up. Back to the 80s. Back to the 80s, yep. And that, by the way, is the 30 year cycle. The low then was 1986. You figure it out. Now, does that mean that we're going to see a few other things? We're going to talk to land cycles in just a minute. But uh, looking at this, if rates go down and everybody has to start selling out, what's going to happen then? <coughs> Land prices are going to get kind of ch much cheaper. But we got a new cycle coming up for land rates going up, starting in 2018. Remember that uh, towards the end of the last, uh, last uh, presentation I had here earlier about uh, cold weather coming and drought? Who is to 
say that land prices are going to go up because nobody has any food. Counterproductive, counterintuitive, possibly, but watch out. Because food is going to drive the next land values up. Along with war. So everybody's going to want to come back to the country to try to grow a garden? Is that what you're saying? I mean, well, you can grow a garden in downtown Detroit right now. A lot of empty lots out there. Yeah, it's possible. Survival. I'm not going to say it won't happen. But I will some places. I can't help but think about that, Larry. Uh, what's so property tax in the situation on this land value? Property tax on the owner. Had a farm sell for sell for me and just fell west of me a little bit. $14,440 an acre. I got my land value to $4,600 an acre. What's that going to do to my taxes? You're going to have a new value of $14,000. <laughs> I'm going to double. My land tax in the county I went in went up by 40% last year. Your land price went up. Let's see you live in North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> was that does that mean that you were too cheap to start with? It's the valuation was so low and they haven't been keeping up with the event. Okay, so they're all, all of a sudden they're doing a one shot and catching up. They're gonna be two two years to do it. Two years, okay. Probably another forty another 30, 40 percent next year again. Well that's gonna hurt some people in cash flow, won't it? Especially about this time about uh, June and July. But watch this, folks. Here's your, here's your support. Right there. 143. It closes below 143 and stays there for about two to three days. This thing could fall out of there. Do you have a timeline for that? Or just, no. Don't have a timeline per se. But I think it's going to happen before June. What's that going to do to the crop rate? What's it going to do to the crop rate? Well, that's a good question. That's going to drop it could drop them. Could drop them. This is going to be a real interesting thing. Now, when that goes down, then take a look at this thing. S&P 500. Interest rates go up. What's that going to do to stock holdings? Right. Down. Why? Because most of these big speculators want to borrow money. They're going to end up with margin calls, so that means they're going to have to sell some stock in order to make them live in the bills. Will they sell stock or are they going to hang on to them and sell something else? In 2008, they went and held on to the stocks and sold something else, specifically corn, soybeans, precious metals, and energy. So that doesn't do you any good either. So that's why we're looking for a sale on the S&P 500. You think that market's going to go down? How low can the S&P 500 go? Well, there's 1,340, and then right now we're around 1,500, or just a little above. Well, that's a 20% drop. Why couldn't you drop that down? Maybe not It might. Now, here's the thing that you need to know: when this market starts dropping. See, this may be a head shoulder stop because there's a branch left shoulder here and it goes back down here for a little bit. This is a five year cycle, five year drop. It could drop all the way back into 2017, 2018. It could. Do you think the Federal Reserve and all the rest of them are going to fight it? Oh, absolutely. They got to what they call the PPT, the Crunch Protection Team. Their job is to win them by S&P 500 futures contracts when the markets are weak. So they're playing with the markets. Now, how many in here know what a, a black swan is? You're basically right. A black swan is an event that nobody foresees. They say it's impossible to happen. Lehman Brothers going broke in 2008, September 2008, was a black swan event. LTC. Pardon? LTC. LTC. 
Walter Cattle? Oh, well, that's 1988. Yeah, that's a factor. Well, the latest one I remember of March, from May 6th of 2011. That's when the computer went with the berserk, and in five minutes they lost a third of the battle. A black swan event coming up could really be a devastating thing. No one knows when they're going to come. I don't know. Look, I think that somewhere in the next, in the next two years, something like this could definitely happen. t bonds could factor it, could affect it. Somebody going broke, they'll uh, say, let's say in uh, Italy, government of Italy. What would happen if they went broke? In fact, what's going to happen if the uh, S&P goes down? Interest rates going up. That's why I'm saying be careful. Watch out, we got some tricky things. What about the cyber terrorism that keep people going all the time? Cyber terrorism, that's a smoke screen. Oh. Yeah, it's a problem. That's not going to be the real fault, I don't believe. That isn't going to be a black swan. I'm not going to say it isn't, because anything can happen. But I'd say it's more likely that someone the government <coughs> control declares insolvency. Then their bonds are no good and everybody makes a run. I mean, with the computers, all you do is hit a couple of keys and you can have everybody a billion dollars worth of stock, stock sold in no time. Well, so, uh, was the housing bubble crash of black swan? How uh, housing bubble crash? I didn't know. I, to me, it wasn't a black swan. And why? Because some people didn't see it coming. Okay. And Martin Weiss and uh, his group did. And um, I was able to take advantage of some of that. The public, yeah. public, most of the public didn't see it. But nobody saw, including them, that Lehman Brothers went broke. Yeah, Barry Stearns and one broke too. Wasn't that a group down the Texas made several million dollars in the market crash? Yeah, Mark Reese and his company. Just he won a one around for two years appreciating the crash. Yep. He won a I was down here, yeah, I was speaking at his seminar back in June July, uh, January 17th, 18th. Down at uh, Palm Beach Palm Beach. Which is uh, probably a little warmer down there than it is up here, but that's another story. Never been there. There's a PGA National in the world of hell. But this is a one thing to watch out for, a black swan event. No one will see it coming. No one. If somebody's been forecasting it for two or three years, that's not a black swan event. Because somebody sees it coming. They're going to make billions do it. When a black swan catches everybody flat foot, literally with their pants down. A couple other ones, and then we're going to go into a couple cycles, and then we have questions. <coughs> U.S. dollar, 81 and a half, lowest 79. Trading range right now. Why is the dollar not doing as poorly or as well as it could be? Well, right now the dollar is probably the best of the bunch. That's a sorry, sickly bunch. But uh, as long as you keep printing, it's from down here. If it gets down well below seventy-nine dollar cents a pound, a dollar, then we're going to be going down. And we're going to go down here to 70, 76. Now, what's that do? Makes your exports cheaper. Now, is there going to be currency wars? Yeah. Probably. Japan's already doing that. So there's going to be some reprisals coming on that. Same thing happened back in the Depression. So we'll keep an eye on that one. I just don't see the dollar going up much from above, above 81. If it does, it's not going to hold. Now, looking at the dollar versus the euro, notice the euro going up, but the dollar really is going down. So that it's a seesaw. If one goes up, the other goes down. That's usually the way it works. Now, why is the euro going up? It's because uh, everybody thinks that the European crisis has been solved. Well, I'm still there, sadly mistaken. But they got it off the front page, so that's why it's going up. <coughs> okay, now we got a couple other things too, but uh, are there any questions on any of this before we move on, finish it up, and then we'll have a general.
Okay, currency war is an impact on farming. New people out here farming, first of all, it doesn't affect your exports. So if the dollar, if they can make the dollar stay cheap for a while, that means uh, you're going to have more people buying corn and soybeans, and especially the Japanese buying meat. They like our meat, even though it's just recently they finally started importing meat and morning it again. But that's number one. Number two is that some of the things that you have to buy may end up going up. Oil. Till we get all our oil, we aren't going to be self-sufficient in oil and gas. Well, we are basically gas, but we're not in oil. That's not going to be for five years. We need two or three more key pipelines built, which takes a little while, costs quite a bit of money. And those are the ones that we need to look at. Oil is priced on a world market, and so it's never going to be. Let me oil is never going to be cheap in the U.S. Uh, well, that's true. But uh, oil basically is priced on basically on the rate in dollars. Now there's some politics on that too. I'm not going to go into all that. But uh, Ramco was the one originally set that up, and that was a political decision by uh, uh, people back in the '60s and '70s. That way, they can control it. But that's going to change. The political change cycle is coming in. It's all going to change. And that cycle will be finished by 2016. So to get back to your question on that, what uh, it's going to vary a little bit. Do we have a vegetable farmer here? Farmer Dave. Oh, okay. You know, your your markets are going to be growing. Seriously, you have non-GMO, you got fresh and good quality stuff. There's going to be people feeding them, you know, beating down a path to your farm. They got money. Well, depending on what money he wants to take, he takes worthless dollars. That's he's going to have lots of business. He may be, he be in a state. He can probably do bartering if he had to. Gold coins. Gold coins, silver coins. And there's going to be a lot of foreigners going to be interested in your work too. So Larry, do we have to be positive or negative? Um, that you stop confusing me to have that. Like it's not this is politics. That's what I'm going to finish up with. Well, but I mean, okay, you seem like a very smart man. Do we? What's this? Does it go? Are we going to be hit by the train, or are we going to have a? Happy well, the question is, do you want to be hit by a train or a falling branch? Yeah. Let me go, for, let's finish up this and then we'll throw it for general questions. It's already 4.30. Remember I was talking about uh, the depression cycles? I want to have more on that, the current issue of 3M, which is finished, being finished up right now. <clears throat> We've got a couple of things going on here in this year, which we usually don't have. Here is a list of the cycles, depression cycles we've had in the recent past. 20 to 12 to 2015. Notice there's seven bottoms in here. You go back all the way to 1755 to 1758. Here they also had set. June 26th bottom, uh, we had a count there, actually it turned out to be June 22nd. It's on a Friday. And the one of the September 19th actually turned out to be the day after Labor Day. So these were the plus or minus two weeks. There's your cycles. Now the key one to watch is this one right here. May 21st. And here's why. Number one. Stock market cycles look weak into that time. Number two, it is possible we can see a, a drop in the interest, a drop in the treasury bond price prices, which means interest rates are going up. Number three, consumer confidence is not at the best, and it has a tendency to be below normal in the springtime, even though you'd think it wouldn't be. 
And number four, and the most important of all, very likely is this. In this time frame right here, there's three eclipses going on. <clears throat> eclipses are, uh, tend to make the stock market very sensitive. Two of the three are definitely financial. The other one is weather. Now the dates are April 26th, uh, then May 9th, which is a, a total solar eclipse, annual solar eclipse, and May 24th. May 24th is the key one on the weather. Do you remember that I was saying that uh, starting around the end of May, uh, the, uh, it's going to start raining in my area. You're going to have rain too. That was going to last all the way through mid-July. That's your cycle, right there. It's in that cycle. I would not be surprised to see a black swan event happen somewhere between now and that time. Don't be surprised. Because that's going to be plus or minus two days, or two weeks, for that May 21st. So I can carry into early June. This is something we haven't seen in about, well, it's going to happen here, 1876, 1877. Well, you've got to tell me what, maybe, uh, I mean, 2015, right? Yeah, I want to go each one of them. 2015. 2015. Yeah. So right now, the key one we need to focus on is this one of 2013, May 21st. The one on November 1st of this year, that has two eclipses around it also. One of them is October 18th, and the other one is November 3rd. November 3rd happens to be a Sunday. So this means we've got a couple of rough periods coming up in stocks, and possibly interest rates. Now, I know I'm full of lots of good news, am I not? <laughs> Folks, do you want to make a fortune? Here's your chance, right there. How do you do it? You did, but uh, best uh, about 0.6 billion and that uh, financial collapse here in the next 60 days. Was that an option? Was that an option? Yeah. Well, I don't want to get too, too involved in that right now because we can go all the rest of the rest of the night. But uh, the point is, if this bottom really hits, that's the time to buy everything. Now, there's certain stocks you should own, there's types of stocks you should own, and then you don't have to worry about them for the rest of your life. We have people here, what, 30 years old or younger? That, this would be perfect for them. Buy a couple of these companies, they keep increasing dividends every year, and they are what I call these commanding positions. If they do that, you will be multimillionaires by the time you retire. You don't have to buy much either. So this is something to watch. Now the other ones here, November 1st, we have already covered. April 21st of next year, that's one. December 15th, there's an eclipse in there too. It's 2014, and the final one on this one is March 17th of 2015. Now, does that mean that everything's over with by then? Not necessarily. Look at here in 1932-34. The bottom there was January 18, 1934. Well, when did we actually get out of the Depression? We're starting the World War II, 1939. So, what about the deal that the world was going to end to the 22nd of December? 22nd of December? Oh, you're talking about the uh, Mayan calendar? Yeah. I don't know, I'm still here. This is <laughs> Now, maybe it's going to end to you financially. That might be a good thing. But, uh, of course, really, I think this is something you want to watch. Because that's it. And the rest of you people, if you want to know when the next one's coming up, it's 2073. So Larry, are you saying basically on May 21st, you're saying the bottom, the bottom's going to fall off? Plus minus two, two weeks. So, but then you're going to have to buy it sometime later if you're saying if you wanted to buy. 
Not necessarily. Are you sorry, are you telling saying selling short the market? Well, if you want to sell high? short, you want to do it now. Because it goes down. But that's called well, danger. Now here's the other question you're asking indirectly. Do you think the government's gonna fight uh, all these uh, sagging markets? Sure. Certainly they're going to. You betcha, you. you're right. And could you see a huge drop coming? Hey, well, what made Warren Buffett? What stock made Warren Buffett? Oh, Coca-Cola, KO is a symbol. There's a company. They're a little high price right now. That's one. If it did, did it for him, it's probably gonna do it for you too, because how long is that? That stock's been paying dividends since 1896. You can't get them much longer than that. They've already been through a couple of depressions. It's still strong. And it's still going. PepsiCo is another one. I mean, that's your Mountain Dew. Yeah, I know. I So if you buy PepsiCo stock, you can go ahead and keep drinking Mountain Dew, I guess. Support yourself. Because what you're looking for is a world-dominating dividend-growing stock. There are 51 of them that I know of, but there's probably a few more. John Deere. John Deere, um, not, not as much as the one I'm thinking of. John Deere's a good company, yeah. don't get me wrong. Excuse me? But the problem... Oh. Huh? I'm going to say that no one else is good. Well, depends on what you're talking about. We're talking about dividends versus... Uh, oh, is that going to go up or is it going to crash? I don't know what it's going to do. I haven't seen this chart this uh, that's why I'm not mentioning John Deere, but it's a new company. Another one, you know, something like uh, Kimberly Clark, K and B. What do they do? What do they do? Yeah. Ever hear of Kleenex? Yeah. 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 Paper, paper towels, toilet yeah. paper, yeah. Kotex is one of the they're number one in the world for women's hygiene products. So, you know, that's, that's a number, that's high price right now, too. Want to get into a medical field? Johnson & Johnson, J&J, the Band-Aid people. They also have Tylenol. Look, that company has been paying increased dividends for the last 40 years in a row. Every year, the dividend goes up. That's the kind of company you want to work for. How about Abbott? Are they still good? Abbott Labs is split. Now they got FD, which is the drug part, and then they got Abbott itself, which is the uh, thing, uh, uh, all the other stuff, nutrient, or nutrition, and they got the medical stints and so on. I'm hanging on to it. I go, I have some of that myself. I'll tell you that right up front. I'm hanging on to both of them. And I bought a few shares for my great granddaughter. How about Apple? Apple, no. Too, too high price right now. If they get Apple down to where IBM is, which is a hundred and some dollars a share, then I'd take a look at it. But they gotta pay dividends. They gotta pay increasing dividends each year. Mayor? Mayor? What? Oh, you mean okay, the drug company, the German drug yeah. company? Uh -huh. I'm not sure about them. I'll tell you, if you want technology, the one I like to lean towards is Intel. INTC. They've been probably paying dividends now for 40 years. So and they're cheap too. Around $21 a share. See, that's just suggestions. You don't have to do them because it may not fit what you're doing. But you buy them, you sit on them, you just wait. Now most traders, most people are not good at that. They gotta have action, no go time. Whereas these stocks, man, you buy them and I'll tell you. It's much more exciting to watch uh, grass grow. <laughs> but just reinvest your dividends, in five to 10 years, you're gonna have everybody beat. So there's a lot of different things that you can do. Uh, IBM has gotta pay dividends every year since 19, 1913. So there's some good stocks out there. They're boring? Yeah, they're really boring, I'll tell you. <clears throat> But you're going to have to count sheep in order to get to sleep at night because you're going to find, geez, that's it's just nothing, no excitement. But do you, do you want it to be exciting or do you want to make money? That, this way, you make money about 99.9% .9 of the time. You have about four different companies, four different industries. There are 14 that qualify. 
What's land going to do for Larry? Land, okay, land prices. The peak of that was uh, back in 2010. Now, uh, why the land price is still going up is because they're, they're printing money. <coughs> so vendors not, they're not making any more of that. That's the old argument with it. So that means that it's probably it's going to go up because they're getting printing money. Now, the new cycle on that is 2018 to 2024. And that's going to be driven by a shortage of food. Yes, this country is going to be affected by food shortage. If you remember, I showed you when the, 20, the next drought comes, don't be surprised if the food shortage ends. 2014, 2015. But don't you think that the price of land is going to come down before the new next cycle comes back up again? Will it come down before it goes back up? Yeah. Maybe it's going to kind of hold where it is. Don't forget, there's still pretty money. That's the key. Yeah, that's the problem. It's just nobody knows what to do with the money. I think well, right now it's not worth much. <laughs> To be honest with you. What about the housing market? We're, we're housing market, okay. Housing market is having some places that showing improved signs. Uh, Florida is showing some signs of improvement, so is California, Nevada, uh, those areas. How many here, what's it, you're about all farmers. So your house is involved with the land, probably. Um, your, your land prices have been going up. But I've got a whole bunch of friends down in my area. They're still underwater because the prices went up well, some, they came down some, and they just haven't come back up yet. So some places in the country are not doing very well yet. I think eventually they will be okay, but it won't be the same value for the dollar. So yes, it could happen. Uh, if interest rates start soaring again, another game. It may go back down. And the reason they'll go back down is because you gotta pay more for your mortgages. The one the alternative there to try and do, if you own a lot of land mortgages, and probably many of you do, is if you're on a variable rate now, uh, if the thing looks like it's about to collapse, switch over to a fixed rate. Lock in the lower rates. I remember my dad borrowed money back in the early to mid 50s. He got his money for four, four and three quarters percent. Man, that looked fantastic in the 70s. We're going that cycle again. Are we doomed to trillion dollar deficits to keep the interest rates down? Doomed to trillion dollar investment um, deficits? I've uh, seen uh, President Obama tonight. He's the one that's keeping it down. Him and uh, but, the Federal yeah, Reserve. But I, 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 I think if we balance the budget, what would happen? Oh, well, if we balance the budget, man, prices would go back up for the interest. Yeah, they're, they're flooding the market to keep the interest rates down. But if prices went up, the government couldn't meet their obligations. Right. So how do you see interest rates holding where they're at? A year? Okay. They're going to hold them down as long as they can. But I'm going to give you that answer. How long that can be, I don't know. But I do know this, that the interest rates are really hurting. They're going to hurt a lot of people when they start going up. And invariably they will. That's a 63-year cycle. And we're at the bottom of it was last year, late last year. So this means it's probably heading north pretty soon. And when it goes, it could go fast. I'm hoping it does. I gotta have a little, I'm a variable rate myself. I gotta switch over. How come we don't see more price inflation with all these dollars? Okay, how come we don't see more price inflation? That's probably because uh, they printed all the money, gave it to the banks, and the banks are sitting on it. If they loan it out, you're gonna see more inflation. That's, that's a very brief answer. It's a complicated problem. But uh, that's, that's a, the gist of what's going on. Can you, uh, can you forecast a 12 and a half million bushel crop for this next year? Yep. Come next November, crop report comes out at 12 and a half million bushel. What would you be forecasting in the future? These are going to be at. If we only have 12 and a half percent, I'll tell you what, prices are going to go up this summer. Did you remember, remember last year when it looked like the crop was going to be well, a problem? Well, that's what did you just see, some 12.5 billion bushel crop? Yep, 12.35. What are you looking at for prices? What am I looking at for prices? I didn't give you a price for No, that's what I'm trying to find out. No, I didn't. Because it's a bad thing to feel like a lot of people 
last year and he wants to do it again this year. I just told him what, you know, what, what the weather forecast says and you go from there. So if you got to get up, you just set a 12 and a half billion bushel crop, what would you be looking for? You have a crop report comes off 12 and a half billion, what do you think, Chris? I'll tell you what, the crop report is probably going to be different on August, September. Okay, he's going to come early. Yeah, you got you to get ahead of those guys. Uh, yeah. You know, skin the rat while you can. Probably where we were. Probably more. Probably more. Yep. But I do see $9 corn eventually. Yeah. Okay. See where Fort Cassidy's on video is actually going to come in the next three years. And if yet you said land prices are going to remain high and you're going higher because they're earning dollars, well, you said that would offset the land deal. I'll tell you what, some of this is a political decision. Yeah. And uh, I don't know which way those guys are going to go. But, if, yeah, let's face it, if you, let me finish one here, then yeah. I'll get back. Uh, if the land prices are going to go up, wouldn't you think that they're going to have to have more for the products that they raises in order to help pay the interest and the pre principal back? Isn't that the way it usually works? Now that means that uh, possibly, we're going to either see land prices stop, they could, they could drop real fast and then come back up. We call that a deep buy, like the picture you got. <clears throat> if that happens, boy, then that's, those are markets, those are killer markets. But if you catch them right, you can make a killer. And if you don't catch them wrong, you're going to get killed. That's why we call them killer markets. Well, that's it. Now, I'm going to go with the rest of them. Grow that super crop. How low we go? Super crop. Okay. In other words, you're saying we have a good crop this year. Three dollar corn. Yeah. Put that. And how what would land go to that? Well, that's going to put a dent in the prices. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the question is, will corn ever go that low? Look, look, when you get speculators and the government involved, what makes sense doesn't always happen. And if it goes down three dollars a bushel, I'm going to be in there buying everything because I know that that is too cheap. You guys can't make money on three dollar corn. No, if we're looking at a drought for 2014 and 2000. Right, you got you got the point. You got the point. And now with that, I buy calls too, and you don't have to worry about whether the thing will go against you temporarily. And you've been making some big old calls. Like hold a thousand calls. That's a bunch of calls. That's five million bushels. Does the crop insurance uh, change the aspect of everything? It can, okay. Because of the drought. I mean, if we had a drought, the farmers don't set enough money this year because they got their crop insurance. Okay, crop insurance, yes, that could be a factor if they change the policy. They won't do that this year, but next year they could. The thing I'm more worried about crop insurance is, <clears throat> yes, the government may be backing them, but how many insurance companies could go broke if we had a, a huge raft of claims like we had last year? They can't do that last year. Well, see, last year they said we were going to have two bad years in a row either. And we did. I don't think this year's going to be as bad, especially for you guys here. But, what about 2014, 2015? There's two more bad years in a row. Possibly. Yeah, but we have the 2014. You better be ready to raise the premiums, too. I'm sorry? You better be ready to raise some higher premiums in 2014. Because that's when the first premiums will go up. I agree with you there. But the value of your crop is going up, too. So there's supposed to be a certain percent. Increasing premiums for non gmo crops. Increasing premiums for non gmo GMO crops. If you have more value, you probably will be increasing premiums. Possibly. I don't think it's going to be very much. Especially if you keep it separate. If you don't keep it separate, you're going to get harder. 